Please remain standing for a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's no way around it. It has been a difficult year. But even in the midst of the difficulties, you can find the blessings of God. I had that reminded to me the other day when I was lamenting all the things that we were having to go through this year and wishing that 2020 had never happened and my wife with fire in her eyes reminded me that our grandson was born in the midst of the pandemic. In other words, 2020 is a good year any way you look at it. There is a blessing there. What you need is the eyes to see it, or at least somebody to remind you of it. As we approach Thanksgiving, it's important, I believe, for us to look back over the last few weeks and months and seek out the blessings of God that have come our way and give thanks for those things. And one of the blessings in each and every one of our lives is the church. And today I want us to be thankful for the church. And that brings us to our scripture lesson. Matthew tells us that Jesus was traveling uh, throughout the countryside, going from village to village, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing people of their infirmities. And people lined up to catch a glimpse of Jesus, to hear his words, and to be touched by him. And Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Now, whenever I have preached on this passage, my eyes have gone first to that verse uh, that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It is highlighted in my Bible. It is underlined in my Bible. But this week, as I looked at the passage, there are two other things that jumped out at me that I want to share with you this morning. The first is Jesus's description of the people in the crowd. He said that they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, most people would look at the crowds and say, they're just along for the ride. They've just come out to see something sensational. They've come out to see a miracle. They want to catch a glimpse of Jesus. They really aren't interested in spiritual things. They're just there to be entertained. But Jesus looks at them and he sees something deeper. He sees people who are broken. He sees people who are struggling in their lives. And he describes them as sheep without a shepherd. It's a little bit like fruit that's ripe. It's on the vine and it's ready to be picked. And the one thing you don't do for sheep that are wandering aimlessly is to leave them to their wandering. The one thing you don't do for fruit that is ripe and on the vine is let it rot and drop to the ground. And the one thing you don't do for people who are harassed and helpless 
is leave them unseen, uncared for, and unloved. Jesus sees the crowd and he empathizes with them. Maybe you've heard the name William Booth. 19th century Methodist minister living in England. One night he couldn't sleep. He decided to go for a walk and he found himself in a part of London he had never visited before, the poor side of town. And during the wee hours of the morning, he saw things that he had never seen. He smelled things that he'd never smelled. And he was horrified. He came home and uh, when he got there, his wife Catherine was beside herself. Where in the world have you been? And he said, Catherine, I've been to hell. And that day, the two of them sat at their kitchen table and they planned the Salvation Army. A ministry that offers soup and soap and salvation to people who are broken and struggling in their lives. Offers a ministry that says, I see you, I know what you're going through, and you are important. You are loved by God. I love the way that the psalmist describes each and every one of us. That we are like deer who are longing for streams of water. Our soul thirsts for God. I like the way that St. Augustine put it. You have created us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. What the scriptures and what the theologians want us to know is what Jesus was trying to say to his disciples that day long ago. People are struggling. And if you will look deeper, if you can see them where they live, deep down in their marrow, what they are hungry for in their lives is a relationship with God. They long for somebody who will come to them and say, as we have heard today, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Each and every one of us longs to be seen and heard and loved and forgiven. And you can't get that at the country club. You can't get that at the theater. You can't get that in yoga. You best get it in a place like this in a time of worship. It's what we long for the most. And one of the best ways for those of us in the church to get on Christ's frequency and looking deeper at people is to ask the question, for whom does your heart break? God's heart breaks for all of us. For for whom does your heart break? I'll give you an example. Just a place where you might want to start. Earlier this week, we celebrated Veterans Day. And I noticed on social media, a lot of people were posting pictures of veterans in their uniforms and they were honoring them this week and saying, we are grateful for all who served in the armed forces, our veterans. Did you stop to think that a lot of our veterans are homeless today? Many of our veterans have come back from war broken mentally and physically. Their families didn't know what to do with them. The pain that they carried around inside, they had to numb it somehow. Many of them have become addicted to painkillers, to alcohol, to other drugs, 
to take their mind off of their pain and their memories. And their families could not handle them, and so they turned them out, and they are homeless. So when you ride down the street and you see that homeless person sleeping in the bushes, when you see that homeless person carrying around all of their possessions in a sack, rather than see them as just another person in the crowd, can you imagine that person as a veteran, as someone who served the country well and is in need of God's love and mercy and grace? Jesus, in this passage, is changing the narrative of how we look upon one another. The other observation that I want to make, the thing that jumped out at me is at the end, after Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, he adds these words. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers into the field. In other words, Jesus is saying, I can't do this by myself. There are all these people who are in need of hearing about God's grace. I can't get the word to everybody. I need some help. Retired Methodist Bishop Will Williman was talking with a Jesuit priest And the priest told him about a time he'd been talking to a lay member of the congregation. And the lay member had said to him, I'm I'm real worried about the future of the church. We need more priests. I'm concerned that we're going to run out of priests one day. And I wish that there was something that could be done. Most likely she was wondering aloud if the Vatican could loosen some of the requirements on priests, particularly to get rid of the vow of poverty and get rid of the vow of chastity so priests could get married and priests could have things and, and, and make it a little easier to attract priests to the priesthood. But this Jesuit priest who had just given his life to the church said to her, there is something you can do. You can pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. Prayer is a powerful thing. And when God's people pray, God answers those prayers. I know. I can tell you. How did I get into the ministry? When I was 19 years old, I was a freshman in college. I had it all mapped out. I was studying to be a secondary education teacher, high school teacher. I was going to teach English. I was going to coach football, basketball, and golf. I wanted to marry a teacher. We were going to live in a small town, and we were going to have our summers free to enjoy with our family. I had it all mapped out. And then one day, the minister of my church came to me at the end of the worship service, and as he shook my hand, he said, Bill, have you ever considered ministry? I looked him in the eye, and I said, no, sir, I have not. He was a big man, about 6'5 or 6'6". I'm guessing he weighed somewhere in the neighborhood of 280, 300 pounds. His hands were about the size of both my hands together. And when he hugged me, I just sort of disappeared into his robe. He wasn't the greatest preacher I've ever heard, but he was a wonderful pastor. And he said to me these words, Bill, when I pray, The Lord lays your name on my heart. And I don't know what to do with that except to ask you to pray. Lord, do you want me in the ministry? Well, from there, it was a long story, but here I am. When we pray, 
When we pray for the Lord to send people into the field, God answers our prayers. God prompts people's hearts and people are moved to respond. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers into the field. In closing, I'd like for you to use your imagination this morning. Imagine that as we're about to finish the service, suddenly the doors of the sanctuary open and here comes Jesus right up the aisle and stands right here at the altar rail. And he looks out over the congregation and he sits down and Jesus' hair is hanging down in his eyes and he's dirty and there's perspiration beating up on his forehead and he says, I just need to take a break for a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm working hard out there. I'm trying to help people understand the good news of the kingdom. And I need some help. And he says, and I'm nominating you folks to help. And then he stands up and he holds his hand out towards all of us and towards our cameras. And he says, I want to bless you. And as he prays the prayer of blessing, you feel cold chills running up and down your spine. And when Jesus finishes the prayer, what you really want to do is go to the mirror and look to see if you look any different. And you take a deep breath and you take an inventory of yourself spiritually. Do I feel any different? Do I feel stronger? Do I feel wiser? Do I feel more spiritual? And the answer is probably no, but you do feel blessed in a way. And then Jesus says, this is what I need. I need two of you to head down towards uh, Midtown, on the west side of Midtown. We need some help down there. There are people who are broken, who need to be seen and heard and loved. And, And I need some of you to go out to Brookhaven. There are more people over there who need the Lord. And and Vinings, I need some people to head towards the Vinings area. And I think that this congregation is well equipped to reach people in those areas. And I need you to go and teach them about God's love. To offer them God's mercy. And to help them to experience God's grace. Now go, go, go. And the image is over. Now I know we're just imagining. We're just sort of pretending. But in reality, isn't that what happens each and every Sunday here? We come here and we encounter Christ. And we are blessed by his presence. And then we are sent out into the world by his spirit. He's calling us. And he says to us, there are people out there that are hungry. There are people out there who are broken and they are in need of God's grace. So this morning, we hear his words, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. Lord, we're praying. Amen.